Two hours up Interstate 85 from Atlanta is Furman University, summer home of Atlanta's football Falcons. In 1973, the sweat and strain of a South Carolina summer forged a winning pro football team. For well, this is where Coach Norm Van Brocklin assembled all the elements of the most successful season in the eight-year history of the Atlanta Falcons. I'm Dick Butkus. You know who I am and what I do. But I want to talk to you about something else besides football right now. I want to talk to you about the Army's new two-year enlistment option and what it means to you. Because you're the one who can get the most out of it. The deal is this. Instead of the usual three or four years, you can now sign up for just two years in today's Army and still have a choice. You can pick the job trading you want, or you can even serve in Europe. Now, any middle linebacker worth his lumps can read that option. It says, go for two in today's Army. Why not talk it over with your Army representative? He's listed in the yellow pages under recruiting. Or call this number toll free. of the NFL season meant three consecutive road games for Atlanta. The first of them in New Orleans, where the season's first score resulted from the all-around efforts of fullback Art Malone, number 25. Together, Art Malone and his running mate Dave Hampton accounted for a total of more than 200 yards. But the big surprise was number 11, quarterback Dick Shiner who started the season by leading the Falcons to almost 500 yards worth of total offense against the seemingly disorganized Saints. Another big opening day story was number 82, wide receiver Ken Burrow, who caught a pass for an apparent touchdown, only to have the play nullified by a penalty. Not to be denied, Burrow caught two other touchdown passes, which did count on the scoreboard. In the late stages of the game, there were foreshadowings of things to come. As a former Minnesota Viking quarterback named Bob Lee entered the game and connected on four of seven passes. In all, the Falcons broke or tied 35 team records as they rolled up the most points and their most one-sided victory ever, 62 to seven. Week two found the Falcons in Los Angeles, where after scoring their most points ever in the opener, they scored their least ever, as the revamped Rams shut out the Falcons 31 to nothing. Week three brought a Monday night game in Detroit, where the Falcons again came up with no touchdowns and another embarrassing defeat, this time on national television. After three consecutive weeks on the road, the Falcons finally got to play one in Atlanta. In the Falcons' home opener, the San Francisco 49ers could score only one touchdown. But for the third straight week, the Falcons could score none. The 49ers won 13 to 9, and after one month of the season, the Falcons were 1 and 3, and tied for last place in the NFC West. In the season's fifth week, number 19, Bob Lee, was given his first start at quarterback for the Falcons, and he made the most of the opportunity. Number 
43, halfback Dave Hampton immediately became one of Lee's favorite receivers. And it was Hampton who scored Atlanta's first touchdown in 13 quarters, or since the opener in New Orleans one month before. Bob Lee bombed the Bears with 11 completions and 13 attempts. And he threw to everyone, his backs, his wide receivers, and his tight end, Jim Mitchell. Lee led the Falcons to five touchdowns against Chicago. And with the backfield of Bob Lee, Art Malone, and Dave Hampton, the Falcons had three of the most important elements of a potent offense. As Coach Norm Van Brocklin said after the game, it looks like we finally got ourselves a chucker. We look like a football team for a change. The Falcons finally had their second victory as they destroyed the Bears 46 to 6. Bob Lee's second start came the following week in San Diego. And once again, the offense was devastating. The scoring started with a bolt up the middle by Art Malone and continued with two touchdowns by Dave Hampton. Four times the defense put Atlanta in scoring position with interceptions. The most spectacular was by number 22, rookie Rollin Lawrence, a defensive back from Tabor. Fullback Eddie Ray wrapped up the scoring with two touchdowns as the Falcons chalked up their first shutout ever, 41 to nothing. With their record now even at three and three, the Falcons next moved up the coast to San Francisco for the rematch with the 49ers, who used two quarterbacks, and both were treated with equal disdain by the rugged Falcon defense. In a bruising duel in the sun, Art Malone injured a knee and was sidelined for most of the remainder of the year, the first of several serious casualties to the Atlanta offense. But there are also bright moments. One came about when rookie place kicker Nick Mickemeyer boomed a 52-yard field goal, the longest in Falcon history. Perhaps the brightest light of all was Bob Lee, making his first professional appearance in his hometown Lee hit on 11 of 13 passes, including five to Ken Burrow, who himself accounted for 164 yards and two touchdowns. The Falcons won their third straight and their second straight on the West Coast where they had won only once in seven previous seasons. San Francisco had a new hometown hero, and his name was not John Brody. The Falcons returned home for the rematch with the powerful Rams, who got off to a 10 to nothing lead. But the Falcons weren't about to allow a repeat of their embarrassment in Los Angeles. Hampton's touchdown was wiped out by a penalty, but Bob Lee just kept bringing the Falcons back. Trailing by one point, with less than a minute left to play, Nick Mickemeyer the five foot nine inch 10th round draft choice from Temple, kicked his fifth field goal in five tries. And for the first time ever, the Falcons had four straight wins 
And we're now just one game behind first place Los Angeles in the NFC West. In the season's ninth week, the Falcons took their four-game winning streak into Philadelphia. The Atlanta defense had given up only one touchdown in its last four games. But now they were up against the NFL's top-ranked passing attack. And their old friend Roman Gabriel and his gigantic league-leading receiver Harold Carmichael led the revitalized Eagles to 27 points against the NFL's top-ranked pass defense. In a high-scoring contest, the punting game proved to be surprisingly important as John James finally bottled up the Eagle attack with the season's most perfect coffin corner kick. The superiority of the Falcons' special teams was also apparent in the returning of kicks as more than 100 yards in punt returns were accumulated by one man, number 34, Ray Brown. After time, the Atlanta special teams had the offense in good scoring position. And time after time, Bob Lee put points on the board. 24 in the fourth quarter, 44 in all. The Falcons won their fifth straight with the help of the sixth and seventh touchdowns of the year by Ken Burrow. But unfortunately for Burrow and the Falcons, a neck injury meant that they would be his last touchdowns of the year. In Minnesota, he had won seven games and nine starts over a four-year period. But in Minnesota, he was only Bob Lee. In Atlanta, he was General Robert M. Lee and the good right arm of Commander-in-Chief Norm Van Brocklin. For the Vikings, the Georgia Peach, Fran Tarkenton, led the only undefeated team in the NFL to an early lead with a touchdown pass to another Georgian, John Gilliam. But this particular Monday night did not belong to Tarkenton and his powerful Vikings but to General Lee and his powerful Falcon. Dave Hampton's touchdown thrust the Falcons into the lead, and Atlanta Stadium exploded. The explosion had not yet subsided when General Lee pulled off the NFL's play of the year. Eddie Ray's touchdown gave Atlanta a 17-7 lead from which the undefeated Vikings never recovered. By winning perhaps the best played game of the entire NFL season, the Falcons had now won six consecutive victories. The Vikings were no longer the hottest team in pro football. The Falcons were. Week 11 found the Falcons in a swampland called Flushing Meadows, Long Island to face the New York Jets and a fellow they called Joe Willie. It seemed that no matter how atrocious the conditions and the pressure, this Joe Willie guy was still dangerous. As they had for seven consecutive weeks, the men of the Atlanta defense rose to the occasion, and when it counted, they throttled Joe and his Jets. Bob Lee again came up with the big plays. This time with two rookie wide receivers who had replaced injured Ken Burrow and Al Dodd. First, Tom Gurdine scored his first pro touchdown. And then Lewis Neal scored his first. The Falcons had won their seventh straight, 28-20.
and assured the best season record in Falcon history. I uh, want you to be the first to know. I joined the Army, so I, I guess it means goodbye. Chris, I want you to be the first to know. I joined the Army, so I guess this means goodbye. Oh, wow. Oh. Susie, I want you to be the first to know. I joined the Army, so I guess it's goodbye. Goodbye? Ginny, I wanted you to be the first to know. I joined the Army, so I guess it's goodbye. Linda, I want you to be the first to know. I've joined the Army, so I guess it means goodbye. Oh, Rod. Al, uh, I mean, Ellen, I want you to... With the Army's delayed entry program, you can enlist now and take up to six months to say goodbye. When did you join? Oh, uh, actually, last July. For more information on enlistment options in today's Army, call this number toll-free. Since Bob Lee took over at quarterback, the Falcons were undefeated and had scored their most points ever. As Lee himself said, the way we're playing now, I don't know if anybody can stop us. But then along came the Buffalo Bills and a man named O.J. Simpson, who ran the ball 24 times for 137 yards, and the Falcons' winning streak had ended at seven. In the next to last week of the season, the Falcons ran up an early 10-point lead on the St. Louis Cardinals, and dreams of the playoffs were still alive. Against Atlanta, the victory-starved Cardinals came up with their best game of the season. Five turnovers helped set up six field goals and 20 points by St. Louis place kicker Jim Bakken. Losing to St. Louis, the Falcons' record fell to eight and five, and their hopes for the playoffs had all but slipped away. In the season's final game, Bob Lee led the Falcons to their ninth straight win over New Orleans, and a final record of nine and five, the Falcons' best ever. But the big story was Dave Hampton and his quest for a 1,000-yard season. For Hampton, the final game was almost an exact replay of the previous season's finale against Kansas City, when he fell short by just five yards. This time, he needed 87 yards, and he got 84, just three short of Atlanta's first 1,000-yard season. Like the Atlanta Falcons, Dave Hampton had once again been stopped just one step short. Despite winning more games than ever, it had been a frustrating season for Coach Norm Van Brocklin and the Falcons. But there were many bright hopes for the future. One shining hope was the Atlanta defensive team, which finally gained league-wide recognition as one of the finest in the game. had its best depth ever with Greg Marks, Rosie Manning, and number 79, the veteran Chuck Walker. At right tackle was Mike Lewis, number 69, one of the league's toughest hitters. At left tackle in his first year with the Falcons was one of the league's most respected linemen, number 74, Mike Tilleman. At left end was number 87, perennial all-pro Claude Humphrey. At right end was one of the league's best and most underrated players, John Zook, number 71.
Coach Van Brocklin said, and the experts agreed, that this was not only the best defensive line in Falcon history, but also one of the best in professional football. Backing up one of the league's best lines was a trio of the league's best linebackers. Tough, experienced, and always ready to stop the opponent in his tracks. The Falcons also had quality depth at linebacker, with established veterans like number 59, Lonnie Warwick, in the middle, and number 51, Dwayne Benson, on the outside. The left side was manned by one of the most dependable and surest tacklers in the game, Don Hansen, number 58. On the right side was number 50, a man once thought to be too small. But what Greg Brezina lacks in size, he makes up in determination. In the middle was number 60, Captain Tommy Nobis, long recognized as one of the finest linebackers who ever played the game. The Falcons led the conference in pass defense holding the opposition to the fewest total yards and the lowest completion percentage, well under 50%. No matter who was throwing the ball, there was a strong possibility of an interception with ball hawks like Captain Ken Reeves, Tom Hayes, Tony Plummer, Clarence Ellis, and the team leader with six interceptions, strong safety Ray Brown. The conference leading pass defense was one of the major factors in the Falcons' finest season. Another major factor in the Falcons' success was the all-conference leg of Nick Mickemeyer. The punting game was outstanding also with John James, an expert at either placing the ball or hanging it up for the coverage men to run under. The Falcons' excellent special teams were another essential ingredient for winning football games. With Bob Lee leading the way, the Atlanta offense became a productive unit in 73. Center Jeff Van Note, guards Dennis Havig, Lynn Gottschalk, and Andy Maurer. Tackles Bill Sandeman and all-pro George Kuntz all played important roles in Norm Van Brocklin's perfectly balanced offense, which gained 2,000 yards in both rushing and passing. The heart of the offense was the running game which usually meant the power play up the middle with Art Malone and number 44, Eddie Ray, or the outside route featuring the flying feet of number 43, Dave Hampton. A winning game plan must also include Captain Jim Mitchell, number 86, who knows only one speed, all out. With another year of seasoning for number seven, backup quarterback Pat Sullivan, and with the return of game-breaking wide receiver Ken Burrow, number 82, and with another year of experience for improving young players like number 84, Tom Gerdeen, and others like Lewis Neal, Joe Washington, Greg Marks, Rosie Manning, Ken Mitchell, Rollin Lawrence, 
Ray Easterling, Larry Mialik, Nick Bebout, and Ted Frisch, and most of all, with the established leadership of quarterback Bob Lee, the realization of one of Norm Van Brocklin's long-standing goals is near at hand. In 1974, the Atlanta Falcons will have a quality player at every position and all the elements of a victorious future.